My baby dolls, we're back again. It's the beginning of June, and it feels like March up here in Boston. 55 degrees, rainy, gloomy, but that doesn't mean summer's not going to come. As always, I am your host, Dianka Hanowitz, and you are listening to Genesis. And today, got another great show. We're taking the time machine back, friends, to the Roaring Twenties, with uh, author Ronald T. Waldo. And uh, he wrote the book, which just came out, not, uh, you know, too far off the mark, called Baseball's Roaring Twenties. (laughs) You know, a decade of legends, characters, and diamond adventures, and I love... The material he puts in here because there's a lot of stuff I didn't know, a lot of obscure things too. He gives love to the umpires, to the babe, you know, we talk about a lot of stuff from the Black Sox scandal until the characters like Casey. We got some managers in here, we got Miller Huggins, we got John McGraw, we got everybody, we got the Philadelphia A's with Connie Mack. So, you know, just sit back, it's going to be a great show. As always, you are listening to the Comfortably Zone Radio Network with the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho. And, of course, Ralph has been doing this for about five years. The network continues to grow. Uh, Ralph and I do a couple of shows, one on the uh, Oakland A's and the next one on Giants Baseball. That's what is he for the Zigzag Man, where we examine the history of both the New York and the San Francisco Giants. And uh, I have a blast with uh, Ralph doing that on Tuesday afternoons. I also uh, am part of, and honored to be part of, Alan Blumpkins and Dave Nemix. Dave Nemix, old-time baseball and trivia. And uh, I have a blast with those guys. Those guys, you know, really know their stuff. And, uh, you know, being much younger than them by about 30 years, it's just an honor uh, to see that kind of baseball knowledge and sitting and speaking with these guys who uh, have been around longer than I have and have uh, done this much longer uh, than, I, than I have for a career. Uh, but now we're going to get to the Roaring Twenties. And, uh, you know, and uh, this is going to be... It's going to be so exciting because you got the babe and you got you got really a change of baseball and uh, the Roaring Twenties was really that um, change from the dead ball era to what we call the live ball era. Um, it really was the golden age of baseball, I think. And uh, you know, a lot of people would say it lasted to 1964 to the end of the Yankees dynasty, but. Uh, you know, before all the problems came and Marvin Miller and, and unions, you know, uh, you had bootlegging, you had prohibition, you had the Yankees, and you had baseball. And uh, this is pretty much where um, it was already America's pastime, but, uh, you know, the golden lights, the jazz age, and all the, uh, you know, wonderful tales that go on that encompass the jazz age, sex, drugs, women, alcohol, it was all encompassed in baseball. And, of course, the author, Ronald T. Waldo, is a baseball historian, author, and member of the Society for American Baseball Research, which people just acronym it as SABER. He has written several books on baseball history, including the 1902 Pittsburgh Pirates, Treachery and Triumph, Honus Wagner and his Pittsburgh Pirates, Scenes from a Golden Era, and characters from the diamond, wild events, crazy antics, and unique tales from early baseball. Uh, all that you can find on Amazon, and we'll talk a little with uh, Ron at the end of the show where you can find all these books. But without any further ado, welcome to the show, Ron. I appreciate it, Ian. I uh, appreciate being invited to talk a little baseball here about, the, uh, as you so poignantly stated, the uh, Roaring Twenties, uh, kind of a... Arid, it was that window to a new time period, uh, from dead ball type tactics to more of that uh, lively ball, and uh, some of the guys that had the power, like the Bambino and others, that uh, revolutionized the game during that era. So I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you. And you know, we've been speaking for a few, uh, you know, uh, years. You've been part of my dead ball era. You've written books about the dead ball era, like um, you know, Clark, Fred Clark, and. Uh, you know, uh, the 1902 Pittsburgh Pirates, and then you wrote a few other books, like the 20, uh, I think the uh, Battling Bucks of uh, 25, was it? Or I Yes, I did that uh, That one. Uh, I did a book on the 38 Pirates, who looked like they were going to win the pennant up until the uh, last week of the season when they were kind of 
taken up, or the, the process of being taken up by Gabby Hartnett's Homer and the Gloman. And I also did a uh, biography on Hayes and Kai Kai Collar as well. So, yeah, a little mix of uh, dead ball era, 20s, and a little bit of 30s thrown in, too, for good measure. And now let me ask you, because even before I get to the inquiry of the book, what fascinates you so much? Uh, because all your books really stop at, at around the mid-1930s and begin in the late 1890s, early 1900s. Uh, it's just an era that, uh, from my youth, I guess I was into. Uh, I can probably give you the story behind it. Uh, in 1971, the Pirates played the Orioles in the uh, World Series, and I didn't go to see any of the games at Three River Stadium <clears throat> that year, but my uncle was kind enough to buy a program. And in the program, it kind of gave a synopsis of each Pirate team before that that had performed in uh, the World Series with photos, box scores, you know, little quick write-ups about the games and such. So I became intrigued because obviously it would have had to do with the Pirates playing in the first World Series with the Boston Americans in 03 and the wagner Cobb battle of 1909. And moving forward to 25, 27, and uh, 1960. So that kind of, you know, the, the reading about that old era, that's kind of what got me uh, what got me started, kind of gave me a feel for, like, I found it to be an interesting time period. And it, for some reason, I even as a kid, uh, Kai Kai Kyler became my uh, favorite player of all time because in one of the team photos, he happened to be a guy that had his hat, like, tilted up which was different from the other guys in the photo. And that stood out to me as a kid, I guess. And for that reason, I kind of latched on to him as my uh, all-time favorite. So, but that's kind of what got me that what got me started on that. And I've just kind of loved the history uh, since I was young. And, you know, it's a, that's that's a great thing. And then plus living in the Pittsburgh area, like we discussed uh, before, and a lot of the stuff on, on Pittsburgh, they have a rich history. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. But you grew, you and I both grew up in an age where, you know, Pittsburgh basically made the playoffs almost every year in the 1970s. Yes, and, yeah. And then when, even when they didn't, they uh, were contending a couple years, you know, be, being beaten up by the, the Phillies. But, yeah, they were always right there trying to uh, win that East, the old Eastern Division with the six teams. Then it was sometimes Big Red Machine in the, uh, you know, in the National League playoffs. And those kind of went both ways, I guess. <laughs> I think the Pirates lost two in the early 70s, but then they won in 79. So it, it, it worked out in the end, I guess. You know, and then um, I'm going to have the Peterson, the father and son uh, team that just wrote the book, The Slide. Uh, they're going to be on the show June 22nd to talk more Pirates baseball. But do you think that, you know, living in the Pittsburgh area, um, rooting for the Pirates, um, gave you more of an interest in Pirates history, which is a lot more richer than, than other teams, say, you know, the Yankees or uh, the Red Sox, because they go back into the 1880s, I believe, with the Alleghenies, they were called, and they didn't really play in Pittsburgh. And then, of course, Honus Wagner and, and the early ones when they challenged the Boston Americans in 1903. Right, yeah. Yeah, it just seemed that, well, obviously, the home team, you kind of gravitate, gravitate towards them, as, even in the historical sense, uh, as following them. That's kind of where you're going to, your interest is going to lie initially. So that's a logical thing. But even for doing the books, obviously, the Many of the first ones were related to uh, pirate history, but when I did the Hannes Wagner book uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago, you know, great biographies had already been written about him, so I wanted to do something a little different with his book, where since he was such a good storyteller that I wanted to have it be stories related to not just baseball, but some of his other uh, interests in life, which would have been fishing, hunting, stuff like that. And after I completed that, I thought to myself, let's try to expand on this and go beyond the Pirates, which led to characters from the Diamond, which was obviously stories around early baseball in the dead ball era, and then my current book, Baseball's Roaring Twenties. Just wanted to branch out a little bit, kind of get a feel for more of the totality of everybody in the American and National League. It, it's not hard to find stories. I mean, there's plenty of them out there chronicled in different uh, ways throughout uh, history. Uh, even players after they retired always like to tell some, t some tales from their days on the diamond and such. Of course, you always have to look out for the embellishment aspect because as human nature is, for even baseball players, they like to embellish a little bit. So you try to find ways to separate the fact from the fiction when doing such a endeavor as this. 
And you know, you know what? You know what I like because most of your books are your earlier works focus on a particular point and now like with your last book you know you know, all the different characters that uh, were coming out it becomes more expansive how was researching uh, for the Roaring Twenties different uh, than uh, your other books and by what I mean by that was it a bigger task or uh, you know because you're dealing with a whole decade rather than a particular point in time or did you find that the research um, you know, it was pretty much uh, the same as what you would do with any book. It's, it, I wouldn't say it was a, a bigger task. It's just the the way you manage how you go about the research. You kind of just do it, you know, obviously differently. Because uh, you're, when you're doing, like, say, a book on the 25 pirates, you're honing in on kind of just that, maybe that year, or the years before, like, okay, how was this team built? Or the year after, which for 26 was, why didn't they, uh, repeat because of dissension on the team, stuff like that. So it's just more of a matter of how you prioritize how you're going to do the research. But it's 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 different. Yeah, you have to do it a, a little bit differently, and you're also doing it differently because you're looking through different uh, sources, too. I mean, obviously, you're doing a book about the uh, pirates. You're going to hit the uh, three, two or three major newspapers that existed at that time for material. And the nice thing even about the uh, Pittsburgh publications, which back then were the press and with the current one we still have in the city, Post-Gazette, and the Gazette Times, and there was a few others also, they did a good job of covering baseball beyond just the uh, spectrum of locally. They were pretty good at delving into some of the stuff that was going on nationally because, I guess, at the time, you know, baseball, Pittsburgh was a big uh, big uh, area for a you know, baseball hotbed. In fact, when the Pirates finally played the Yankees in 27, that was – the World Series that had been you know, had been hoped for and anticipated prior to that because Pittsburgh was considered such a major force in the National League with Barney Dreyfus and owning the team, you know, having the success in the first uh, decade of 20th, 20th century, and then once again kind of recapturing that glory during the 1920s. But the thing with the research, it's just a matter of you know, remaining focused. You kind of know, like I'll break it down. I know who. Your basic players you want to kind of check out, you know, you're obviously for the 20s, Babe Ruth, uh, people like that, Frankie Frisch. It's, you know, sometimes you got to really dig hard for, like, those little nuggets of gold regarding people like a like a Heine Mueller, you know, that's chronicled in the book, or some of the minor league guys like uh, an Augie Prudhomme, such, you know, those ones. Yeah, you kind of got to do a little digging around to find some things related to those. But, like I said, there's always a treasure trove of stuff, so it's more like – for any book, I always have more material than I need, and it's just a matter of breaking it down to try to put it into the context that I want to do when I do a particular work. And let me ask you this, Ron, because, uh, you know, I'm one of the few people you probably know that read, actually read the notes in the bibliography, Mr. Lawyer. Yeah. Me. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, hey. You're not, you know, you're like, not the only one. I've, 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 yeah, there's, there's actually some people that, that – uh, delve into the index quite, which actually when I was younger, that's how I kind of always would look for a book. I'd see if certain people were covered in it. But, yep, go ahead. I understand. Well, bibliographers is, is key. but You know, because you break it down into books, newspapers and magazines, and then websites. Now, let me ask you, can't you find, like, the books and the newspapers online, and then you literally have to go to libraries? And, and well, be, because of, well, the books, some I have physically because I've actually, you know, bought books over the years, but a lot of what I do actually is online just because of constraints for what I can, you know, you know, other obligations and such. That's the best route for me to go. Luckily, a lot of stuff is available online. Not all of it is through the, uh, uh, you know, free, free aspect, but, you know, you can, you know, subscription for stuff so, uh, to find pretty much anything uh, in lieu of actually going, you know, going to the libraries, which I know a lot of authors do that, but for me, I, that's just not a possibility at this time period, so I try to do the best I can with what I have to work with. You know what I do? You know what I do to do some research? Because you could Google it to death, you could uh, Bing it to death, and you know, and you could do all that, but I also go to iSeq, and that's more of the educational um, stuff for uh, research. So I go to iSeq, besides just doing the Googles and stuff, and then I try to locate the actual papers and stuff like that online, and then match up whatever was... Uh, exactly, uh, yeah, you know. right. That's yeah, kind of like what we, yeah, you would call like the backtracking on what you 
yeah, finding out the first time. That, 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 that'll happen a lot with me, too. Well, actually, with the books. I'll actually look through the books a lot, and then I'll actually try to find the original source, you know, in the newspaper or, or if it was in, well, if you're talking older stuff, if it was uh, Sporting Life magazine, obviously Sporting News, or even Baseball magazine, if you're going back, you know, now, to, to the eras I cover. Oh, yeah, Baseball magazine. I mean, I... You see what I put up there in the Thai Cup. Sometimes I say, hey, Sam Crawford graces the cover of Baseball Magazine February 1916. That was pretty much the big news sauce. As well as, you know what's good? Uh, near uh, Pittsburgh, the Buffalo newspaper up there, they covered the Thai Cub and uh, Tris Speaker affair with uh, Dutch Lennon and all that stuff that happened in 1926. Really well that when you look at the news sources, uh, they do. I think it was the Buffalo Gazette. I forget the name of the paper, but uh, I have it because I'm researching for a book myself. And I use all these periodicals because most of these guys, if not all of them, are dead. You have to go to their yeah. families. That, you know, have you gone to any of these guys' families and stuff like that and done some interviews about stuff that they might have? With the collar book, uh, yes. I, and in fact, I still actually correspond with his granddaughter. They helped me out on some some facets of it, yes. Very, very helpful. Actually, great people. In fact, uh, they just bought five of the new book, and I signed five and sent sent them up, you know, where they to where they live up in Michigan. So yes, they. Uh, she, yeah, the granddaughter is very helpful. His, his daughter is actually still uh, still alive. Wow. That is actually that chronicled mean? chronicled in the book that I did on him. But yeah, just with some logistic stuff, they didn't want to like be part of the actual context of the book. But yeah, very very helpful with. Uh, Figuring out when I had little little things that I needed to square away, and then I believe after a year, couple of years after the Fred Clark book came out, uh, his granddaughter actually did get in touch with me to thank me for writing the book. Oh, that's so funny. that was that was actually interesting. And did they still live in the area? Are these folks like no. Well, with Kyler, I mean, he only played her through uh, 27. Obviously, with the little part in the book, it kind of delves into the disagreement he had with manager Donnie Bush at the Pirates in 27. And then he shipped them to the Cubs in 28. So he was here full time from 24 through 27. He uh, came up late a couple years, yeah, you know, when the recalls would happen in September. But most of his career, Cubs after here, and then uh, Cincinnati and uh, Brooklyn. In fact, from talking to his granddaughter, corresponding with her, most of the stories that even her mother, which would be Kyler's daughter, remembers, didn't really deal with the Pirate years. It possibly because, you know, when you have a season-long feud with the manager, I guess maybe you're not going to want to remember those years, like, close to your heart, I suppose. Unfortunate situation, though, you know, they ended up trading a talented outfielder that year. And in fact, uh, little known, um, um, you may know because you're steeped in following baseball history, but, you know, Pirates also had Joe Cronin. Uh, they did. Yes, and uh, Donnie Bush didn't see enough in him. He let, let him go after the 27 season as well. And Cronin actually received a lot of tutelage from Collar, which Collar was always great for doing. He always took young players aside and helped them out. Even the guy that replaced him for most of September, well, he had been benched after a little incident where he didn't slide at second base to break up a double play in an August game against the Giants. And he didn't really play much the rest of the year, and I think, believe after a game in Cincy in early September, he didn't see the diamond again that season. But a youngster was recalled because of injuries. Adam Komorowski, he actually tutored him, even though this was the guy that was kind of taking his spot. So, I think, good, I think good, com good com camaraderie back in that era with some players. I mean, there were still the hard-headed individuals who, <laughs> you know, did things their way. Well, look at Leah DeRocher. Hey, Bruce couldn't stand him. <laughs> As a you know, I mean, for God's sakes, you know, he stole uh, Babe Ruth's watch and stuff like that. And, yeah, you had characters like him. Let me ask you, let me ask you this question. Um, you know, when it comes to, like, uh, the whole uh, dead ball era ending, why do you think, and, uh, you know, I know the answer, but I want people, I want you to explain to people why, uh, you know, is it that the, dead ball era, ending with two things. Number one, the Black Sox trial. And number exactly. two, number two, um, you know, uh, 
using different balls during a game instead of letting one ball just be mushed like a head of cabbage by the time the seventh inning rolls around. Yeah. Change things. Man, I'd actually throw in the Great War, too. That kind of, I mean, it conveniently acts as a good, like, you know, one of those points in history, at, you know, because obviously attitudes change just amongst people throughout the world, I guess, because of that. It kind of seemed interesting that also baseball then changed as a result. But with Ruth hitting the 29 homers for Boston in his last season there, and the realization that, that I'm going to guess that everybody knew this guy was the, the real deal as far as you know a, being a power hitter, uh, it, it's, other teams obviously are going to say, well, we got to find our, our guy that's, you know, a basher like Ruth. A lot of teams stuck with the still kind of playing a little bit of the old style. I mean, the old style didn't totally die. I mean, when you have guys like McGraw and Max still around, they were still going to look for ways to utilize runs. But it was, yeah, the different uh, years. I know in 22, the baseball was fairly juiced because the averages were pretty high that year. And then I think in also 25, uh, the baseball, uh, I think Babe Adams said it was like a golf ball sometimes and it would bounce on the infield. So that also, you know, but you figure they probably changed the ball to revolutionize where they were going to be going with, with Ruth being the guy leading the way. Because, you know, Spreaker and Cobb maintained that the ball remained the same. He said there was nothing wrong, you know, nothing different about the ball. Uh, they, to the dying day, they would say, you know, there was nothing. It was just the way you held the bat and the strategy got different. And you were right. I mean, do you agree with that, That they, what they said, or uh, do you think they were? I think that any changes were, were minute, but it, it all played into the whole narrative. But, it, yeah, the strategy thing was the, I mean, obviously when it, you weren't playing for the one run where you had a guy that could come up, you get a few on base, and he could knock in three, you know, you got, you know, the Ruth, and then later a Hack Wilson. And a guy like a Kenny Williams for St. Louis and Garrig, and even Cy Williams for the Phillies, guys like that that could put the ball over the fence. It, yeah, it's going to change the complexion of all the strategy. Plus, you know, as you go through the 20s, you get a little bit of a new wave of managers, like, you know, Joe McCarthy finally hitting uh, the major league scene with the Cubs in uh, 26. So if you get a little new era of managers, too, it's going to stand a reason they're probably going to implement some new practices, and they're adapting to what's going on out in the field. And obviously the fans like the uh, new style of baseball, you know, a little more hitting and such, a little more tougher on the pitchers, but, <laughs> but good good for the fans and good for the uh, – They always said chicks dig the long ball. <laughs> <laughs> And Ruth is a – well, let me ask you this question. I love the way that you broke up the book. You didn't break up the book by, like, a timeline. The timeline flows with the tra- chapters. Like, you would organize it like, well, look, here's the dead ball era. You know, Big Bam comes on. And then you got, like, chapters like Yankee Swagger. And, you know, it's, it's no particular time. And then you have, like, Shanty, Tiny Possum. And interesting diamond incidents, and you break it up into a collections of stories. Do you think the mo- the, the uh, story moves uh, better this way when you chapterize it? For this type of book, I think it does. You kind of want to categorize certain things. Plus, I try to get the feel of maybe when you were young, your grandfather may be telling you stories from you know when he was younger, you know going to games, watching baseball. They wouldn't always necessarily be, well, here, he's like, I'm going to start with, okay, I started going to games in 1920, and I'm going to work my way up through the 50s. It would be like, you know, things that, like, stood out in his mind, like, okay, this thing happened in 1928. This was, like, the thing that I remember is, like, the greatest moment I ever experienced attending a game, or then this one was in, you know, 1935, stuff like that. And the key is to keeping it kind of together. I mean, I kind of try to structure it, like, with the one chapter where you go from uh, – We'll see more, not so much his pitching, which was phenomenal in 1927 for the Yankees, going 19 and uh, seven, but more of you know the bet with Babe Ruth about his hitting, which he ended up winning the bet because he ended up eclipsing uh, how many hits Ruth had given him a minimum amount of hits he was supposed to hit that year, and uh, Moore did it. You know, they go from that to then Henry Johnson as you know pitcher for the Yankees, going five for five in a game against 
an opposing team in 28 when he basically decides to bat from the other side of the plate against a right-handed pitcher. And then that can, you know, you lead that into the story about what was the precursor to the DH rule now, uh, proposed at the league meetings after the 28 season because Johnson was for that. Like, hey, yeah, it's tough enough pitching. Let's have a guy bat for us too. Whereas most pitchers weren't for that because they wanted to be part of the strategy aspect of, you know, Laying down bunts, and then of course that rule never, obviously never got uh, implemented until very much later in the 1970s in, in the American League. Let me ask you this question, and, and you know it, it's you know because we again we got to deal with Kinnish on Mount Landis here, and um, the American League had Ben Johnson, the National League had its own president. But yet all the American League pres- uh, owners went to Landis and basically begged him to become the czar of baseball. Didn't Ben Johnson do uh, enough to, you know, cur- curtail the um, gambling besides the 1919 uh, uh, Sox uh, scandal? Or do you think that he uh, overlooked a lot of these things, which made the owners just go and uh, beg Landis for, uh, to give him the job, which he, he really didn't want to take to begin with? No, but as by Chronicle in the book, he kind of reflected on doing it for the kids because it meant to recall the uh, story in the book about the conversation he had with his son, you know, Major Reed Landis, that had uh, been a pilot in the Great War when they went to a game between the Dodgers and the Indians in the 20 World Series. You know, basically, his son had said it would be a shame if the game was ruined because of the kids, and that's kind of what he said. He, he basically took on the task of being the commissioner to do it for the kids. Uh, Johnson, uh, with the national commission that they had uh, up to that time, there was always going to be issues. Uh, I don't know if you've probably read about the fact that in the uh, second decade of the 20th century, the Pirates had initially put in a claim for George Sisler, which they ended up losing because the national commission basically awarded them to the bronze. I mean, the details basically were – we signed them, but he he was underage, and his parents supposedly gave consent for the Pirates to sign him. But then the Bronze signed him when he was of age, so it ended up, you know, the National Commission decided that he went to the Bronze. And the National Commission would have been always the AL president, the NL president, and uh, Cincinnati team owner Gary Herman, who also ran a foul with some people because of, you know, him, how he weighed down on decisions. But, yeah, it was probably time to have a guy, just a single arbiter, who ever saw the whole baseball scene rather than three guys who, you know, obviously the NL president's interest would have been more peaked towards the NL, and the AL president's would have been more to his league. And Herman sometimes, his interest might have been, well, if it's a National League team doing better by a decision, maybe i got to go the other way. So I think it was, yeah, a lot of that where it was just time for a single ruler over seeing the whole game. And you know what I don't like about Landis? His his um, his record is uh, checkered and is contradictory in a lot of things. One is he exonerates uh, Chris Speaker and uh, Ty Cobb later on after the Black Sox scandal. But the main thing is was that years before, when the Federal Leagues um, sued the um, – baseball, Major League Baseball, it ended up in his court in the lower courts, and, you know, he had his ruling and stuff, but here we have the Black Sox, and the Black Sox were acquitted by a judge in a court of law, for God's sake, and Landis is like, to hell with that, I'm throwing black leather law out, this isn't going to happen in baseball, baseball's not going to adhere to the law, we're going to suspend these guys permanently. What do you think about yeah, it? Yeah, I think it was kind of, he had to set the precedent to basically show that, hey, when it, it's me, you know, that's going to dictate. But you're right, he did kind of uh, waver on some, as you just mentioned, and the one I chronicle in the book, the Jimmy O'Connell incident, where he, hey. uh, he offered the, 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 the bribe to Heine Sand. O'Connell claimed that he was put up to it by Frisch of the Giants, uh, Ross Youngs, and George Kelly, and in the end, when he, you know, Landis heard testimony, it was just uh, O'Connell and then Cozy Dolan, the coach, who basically did admit that he uh, told O'Connell to offer Sand the monetary inducement to, uh, you know, ask him to throw the series, which obviously was irrelevant because the Giants ended up winning the 
necessary game error and beat out Brooklyn for the pennant in 1924 anyway. But uh, you could say that, yeah, there was a little uh, – I guess he, he took it each situation as its own and weighed what the consequences would have been if he, I guess, went too far. But the, but the Black Sox thing, it was more – just in my opinion, I think that set that precedent of how much authority he actually had, not just with, I guess, players. I think actually with maybe the owners, too, to let them know. You know, I you guys, you know, tasked me with this job. Uh, this is how it's going to be. You know, some, I'm going to guess maybe some may have regretted it at some point, but it's hard, it's, it's hard to say. Well, let me ask you this question. The Cincinnati Reds would beat the, um, the White Sox in the uh, 1990, uh, 1919 World Series. You know, their outfield, Ed Roosh, you, you do this in the book. He claimed, look, my team always <laughs> you yeah. know, did this kind of thing. Right. Oh, it was prevalent. I mean, if you go back, I mean, stuff I've read on the 03 First World Series, I mean, friendly bets were made by the, you know, the owners, too. I mean, there was no, well, there was no, like, evidence of games thrown. But, I mean, yeah, there was always betting going on. I mean, this is kind of where it just came to a head that year. Well, plus the manner in which it happened. Of course, also from the book, the Reds always claim that they feel they beat them fair and square. But as I said in the book, when you're, you know, guys getting involved with the CD element and they basically double cross you, I mean, that's why that's why you should avoid getting involved with people like that. But you know, the climate at times they were upset with how Comiskey was. I'll say I'll just use the word thrifty, too thrifty, you know, with the salaries and other stuff. I mean, I guess that kind of made some guys figure, well, this is a chance for me to get the kind of money that I wouldn't see playing here. Now, let me ask you this. 1920, okay? A lot of stuff goes on. We got the Black Sox scandal, and then in 20, we got the whole trial. Uh, 20 to 21, we have the whole trial. Um, you know, now baseball's even more tarnished than ever. But here we have a 20-game winner from the dead ball era. You know, and we spoke about the baby before. Do you think that he saved baseball? I do. And I also think he was... Uh, as far as public relations, was a master. He, he he knew what needed to be done. I mean, he did it on the field, but he did it away from the field, too. I mean, he just, was just very good at, you know, building that aura around him or that, the, the mythical nature because he was something new as far as being a power broker. I mean, others followed him, but he was, I mean, and there had been a few before him that had done it, but not in this manner. I mean, in you know, 19, you know, 20, he just, yeah, first year with the Yankees, he just takes the league by storm. And they were in the, you know, hunt till the very end before Cleveland ended up coming out on on top, on top. And then other people ably came behind him, but I think at that time period that was what they needed was someone like him to basically rinse out that bad aftertaste of what had happened from the 1919 World Series. Because that involves some, you know, marquee names, you know. Because uh, that team, those were, those were star players, a lot of them, in the American League. So, yeah, the Ruth, and it was good, too, because then you now have the uh, juxtaposition with a new kid on the block in New York on the American League, which I'm sure from reading the book, you see some of the stuff that happened in the, those three Subway Series clashes. The Giants didn't want the new kid on the block to be usurping their turf. So, uh, made for some good, uh, good baseball and some good... Uh, headlines and some heroes being born out, out of all of it, like, uh, you know, Stengel, even though the uh, in 23 the Giants lost, still hitting those two homers in the different games, one the inside the park homer where he's basically chugging around the bases, barely made it in the home plate. So it's just good good stuff. Uh, but I'd say the Babe definitely was the, uh, the maestro that kind of led the orchestra of getting things back on track that uh, in that decade. And, you know, of course, the Giants were the uh, were pretty much the only team in town when you think about it, although the Yankees were the Highlanders and then the Yankees, and they played at the polo grounds, of course. But uh, McGraw hated uh, Ruth. He hated them because he infringed upon uh, media, which, of course, John McGraw got all the attention. I mean, even when uh, uh, McGraw had to retire, uh, from baseball uh, that day, uh, Garrick 
hit four home runs. The only time he hit four <laughs> runs in his career. And what do they have as the main thing? McGraw, you know, retires from baseball. But let me ask you this. You mentioned before that uh, some of the teams, including McGraw, uh, played, the, played the small ball still, even though we're in the live ball period. Do you think that the series, because it was three years in a row, 21, 22, and then finally 23, the Yankees got over the hump. Do you think at 23 is when the transition happened between the the, the uh, long ball and the uh, small ball? Well, it's see, some teams it didn't go with the true home run. I mean, they, the Giants did have George Kelly, uh, but I mean, he's, yeah, he wasn't going to hit him like the Bay. But I mean, they, they kind of transitioned to the guys that could hit the gaps for doubles and stuff like that. I mean, the Giants had great hitting teams. I mean, they were some solid, you know, a lot of Hall of Famers from that era. It just was, you know, I'd say the first true power hitter that came about for them would have been Mel Lott, but he didn't really, you know, he was young in that era. He really made his mark more in the 30s you know, as far as a true power hitter. But it, it was, I'd say McGraw did start getting away from in fact, I'm actually, hopefully, I mean, I'm finishing up a sequel to this one on the 30s. He, he actually made a comment regarding, and I guess when he, what you just referenced when he decided to step down. And by the way, when I, for what I've written, I do give him his due. I don't mention anything about Gehrig's home runs from that day. I actually let it stand on him, but he did say that one of the reasons that he stepped on other than his health was that there was no challenge to managing anymore, you know, because it was all about, just the guys that could hit, you know, he thought there was no more thinking or strategy in the game. And when you think about it, and the way that the dead ball had to be played, and the bats they used, bunting and stealing and trying to, you know, uh, you know, stretch a single into a uh, second base, and not a lot of balls go over the uh, fence. Chances are you, know, you can't even see the ball. It's dark because it has spit on it. It has tobacco juice. It has, you know, grass stains. It has dirt in it. Everything's in there. God knows what else. Shoe polish. God knows what else is in it. Now you're having something where you have to change uh, constantly. Uh, if you're going to hit the long ball, what the hell is the strategy on the bases? Just try to hit it over the fence. Do you think that um, Do you think that a lot of managers had that kind of difficulty of uh, transitioning? Well, a lot of them didn't have the uh, pieces at their disposal, too, to transition. It took a while. I mean, the Pirates in 25, Glenn Wright and Kai Kai Kyler set that year the team record for home runs, which was 18. Each of them had 18. Half of Kyler's were inside the park. So the Pirates didn't have a guy, you know, I think Archie Vaughn broke out in the mid-30s. And then uh, in 38, a gentleman named Johnny Rizzo finally cracks the 20, you know, 20 mark. And then, you know, really there's nobody till Kiner then after him. So, yeah, it's kind of tough for if you don't have the pieces at your disposal – I mean, it changed the way you scouted. I'm sure he started looking for guys that could, you know, mash a little more. It just worked out quite well for the Yankees if they had Ruth and then Garrick and even you know, a guy like Tony Lazari. But let's not forget, they were complimented well. I mean, a guy like Earl Combs at the top of the order gets on. Easy, you know, one of those guys cranks one. If he's getting on, you know you're getting two runs instead of one. Even their shortstop, Mark Koenig, or for your – Good, good player getting on base. So, you know, you had the balanced lineup, but having the bashers, it made it easier because, yeah, if you get those first two guys on and the babe hits one, you're up 3 nothing. Whereas a Pirates team in the 20s that always had high averages, you know, you might be getting Don further in the order in a big inning before you're, you know, going up 3 nothing. You know, it would have been more utilizing like a Max Carey stealing or the hit and run, which was a problem with Kyler in 27. That was part of one of the the issues with him and Donnie Bush, Collar didn't want to hit second in the batting order because he, he didn't feel he was good at hitting behind a runner. He liked to swing away from his heels. You know, he thought he should be hitting third, which he had established as his spot the previous two years. But, you know, Paul Wainer, second season, started, he, you know, that year Paul batted third and clean up a little bit. And he had a big year. He set the Pirate single season mark for RBIs in the season. It stood since then, so... Logically, Donnie Bush is going to use a guy that's going to drive in the runs, hitting third. Let me ask you this. Also, you got other characters in there, which I love. John Walter Dustin Nails. Now, if you look at his, if you look at his record, it's nothing particular. He's 32 wins, 25 losses, and seven major league seasons. 
But here's the kicker here. I mean, he played on the Brooklyn Robins during the World Series uh, team run, Cleveland Indians when they did win the World Series, and the St. Louis Cardinals. So he was around, Dusta. What makes him so special for this period? Uh, he was he was one of those eccentric, oddball guys, as you read for some of the stuff. He very uh, like a lot of guys. Well, I'd say in that era and before that, just very. I mean, they didn't seem to be when they hit the. Big time, or they were in the minor leagues. They didn't seem to be overwhelmed by their surroundings. They had an attitude, kind of a cocky attitude, and they didn't have any inhibitions about exhibiting, you know, the way they were. So, uh, yeah, a couple of the minor league stories. The uh, one story where he basically Jim Pohl, he tells him, "I the great male, so I'm gonna strike you out," and he does. You know, it's a, he stops the game on a three-two count to basically boast to anybody, you know, in the seats near the field. And Paul, and then the next day, Paul was like, I, I thought you were conning me. You were going to throw a curve, and you still threw the fastball, basically challenged them. And Paul was thinking, all right, a little bit of psychology here, but also being true to form, cocky and brash. Yeah, I'm going to throw you the fastball, and you're going to strike out. And that's what happened. You know, a guy like him or a guy like Heine Mueller, who, you know, with the Cardinals, Giants, just, you yeah, know, Guys that are have a weird take on how they approach the game and the stories that come out of it because they're just uh, have that odd way of going about things. It just makes for a little, a little more zest and spice in the era. But yeah, Mills had a pretty good debut with Cleveland that uh, short stretch there before the pennant, basically going undefeated at the end of the year. So. And then did yeah. help him in the World Series and over uh, Brooklyn as well. But, yeah, he bounced around mainly in the minors, had a lot of good 20-game seasons in the minors. But, yeah, obviously he's, in, he's not in the book for his stats. He's in the book for the stories about his uh, character and his attitude toward the game and life, I would say. Now let's talk about Stengel a little bit because a lot of people don't know that, you know, we, when we think of Stengel, we think of the Yankees as older. But again, he started with the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Robins. He was even on Pittsburgh for a year, Philadelphia. Um, how instrumental uh, was Casey, um, not only for the dead ball era and into the 20s, but also the fact that he was groomed by McGraw and literally carried out a lot of things that McGraw um, taught him well into his uh, you know, 70s, even with the Mets. With Casey, he's kind of like a like Ruth, who's a good ambassador for the game. Because whenever Casey talked, everybody listened. Because <laughs> when he usually talked, he had interesting things to say. And from the few things that are chronicled in the book, from his you know managing the Toledo Muttons in the twenties, uh, just yeah, he just it was always a, a, like I'm lamenting the fact that this you know this guy's not doing this or this you know guy like the two stories about the pinch hitters where he basically told the umpire to, you know he called time out and the umpire wants to know why because his pinch hitter is like the king of the uh, major league pop up and there's a little plane circling over the field so Casey's like well we want to make sure that we wait till this plane leaves till we continue play but he he just had a way uh, like a raconteur with his you know, neat tails and such that kind of helped to push baseball in his his neat little way. But at the same time, yeah, he was basically being groomed to, you know, become bigger and better, do bigger and better things. I mean, he started breaking in as major league manager in the 30s with uh, Brooklyn and Boston and then eventually, you know, had the great career with the Yankees. But like the stories of the 20s and 30s, when you read those, Having already seen many stories from when he was manager of the Yankees, you can see it's pretty much almost the same type of attitude with the way he he was. Just trying to, I think he, he kind of brought his own little twist to the game by the way he, you know articulated events and uh, players. Now, now here's somebody that uh, not a lot of people know about: Wilsey Cybor. Uh, great year in 1927. I mean, they pick him up, a uh, long-time minor leaguer, kind of went by, under the radar, had the big 
big season pitching in the minors in 26. Yankees took a shot on him, and he, as in the book Connie Mack State, he was he Mack thought that Moore was the reason the Yankees had so much success in 27 because he was a multi-purpose pitcher. You could bring him in from the bullpen whenever you needed him to you know, basically put out a fire, and you could start him in games where you needed him to start, and it allowed the other pitchers to kind of be able to do their thing. Your uh, Wade Hoyts, your George Pipgrasses, Herb Pennox, those guys could just not have that burden of, you know, because back then some of your bigger names would come in and relief the kind of quell a, a opposition uprising late in the game and stuff like that. And, of course, in the book, uh, we'll see was known as the three, do, three what, what was it, the uh, needle and thread guy or the needle and thread man because he was able to come in and solve games late when the Yankees were trying to hold on to a lead. And you know something? It's, yeah, in a day where relief pitching really wasn't a uh, commodity like it is today, it was just like for those who couldn't pitch, uh, start pitch, and those who were getting on in years who could just throw a couple of innings to, like, you know, get them through. I'd be like, hey, you have a great chapter on the umpires. Why is being an umpire during the Roaring Twenties a lot different than it is today? I think the umpires, eh, umpires have always <laughs> had to deal with the, uh, you know, adverse situations. I think the big key from back then is umpires, you know, still had a, have concerns with people in the crowd. It obviously wasn't like the late 1800s and dead ball era where the stories of umpires basically being accosted as they left the field and stuff like that. I mean, you know, in the 20s you still had like a McGraw who was well known for, making his point known with an umpire and sometimes doing it in a vociferous fashion. But, yeah, as compared to today, your umpires today don't have that exposure to obviously worry about bodily harm, (laughs) I guess. But uh, it's always been about, I guess, any error if you're an umpire, just trying to make sure you follow the rules. Don't enter yourself in the equation, which sometimes has happened throughout baseball history. The umpire sometimes becomes a story rather than just the afterthought when events have happened, which some of them is I chronicle in the book. You know, some of them are more humorous things where there's the diffusing of a situation by an umpire or an odd situation that arose, like the story about the uh, Tiger-Cleveland game where basically Detroit ran out of catchers, and Cobb, who had also been thrown out of the game, he was managing at that time, wanted to use Fred Parrish, who's a coach, as a catcher, and the umpire said, well, if you do, you, well, you can't. And I guess Trish Speaker was like, that's against the rules, but it was a holiday game, so they had a big crowd, so it was decided that Speaker would protest and continue the game, let the guy play, which was a moot point because uh, Cleveland ended up winning the game in extra innings on the home run. But, yeah, stuff like that. I think the umpires back then kind of be, tried to be a little more I don't want to say sinister, but, you know, try to make sure they staked out their turf, too, as far as when it was, you know, maybe some managers or players were trying to get into their, like, territory in a metaphysical sense, I guess. And, you know, Bill Quinn, probably um, pretty much the pioneer, uh, he was in his, what, third decade, I think, in the 1920s? He had started in the yeah the fr- middle of the first decade of the 20th century. So he was yeah he was actually yeah you're right he had actually surpassed yeah by the end of the 20s he was well past his second decade. So he was in between yeah the second and third. Well even the Billy uh, Billy Evans too had uh, started back in around the same time and then Evans ended up retiring as an umpire and became well business manager of the Indians. That was the name they used for general manager back then. They called him the business manager. But, of course, Clem, we know the nickname he hated, correct? <laughs> didn't like yeah, that was did, Catfish, did not like right? To, did not like to be called Catfish, no. That was Catfish. As, uh, you know, that's, that, that goes back to the old days when uh, one of them called him Catfish and stuff like that. And, uh, oh, he would get, he would just get ripped uh, about that. But, hey, you know who's still, you know who's in the 1920s that a lot of people don't know about? Because they know... You know, they know his whole stint with the Dodgers and Jackie Robinson. Branch Rickey, where's he yeah. and what's he doing? Yeah, Cardinals. He was overseeing the Cardinals. Yeah, 
in the book. Yeah, him and uh, him and Heine Mueller there. <laughs> You know, some some good stuff. The story about Heine and done in uh, spring training the one year in uh, Texas. And Branch gives his uh, usual talk as about cars. Branch was vouch, vouched against drinking, strong proponent of abstinence from alcohol of any kind. And you know, he gave his little talk before the start of spring training to his players. You know, don't follow this path for this or that. And Mueller was... You know, seemed to be uplifted by that. So that night, he goes out, and with family living near the area, he takes a female cousin of his name, Lulu, to the local ice cream parlor. And during the course of their journey, uh, Ricky is walking down the street. And, of course, Heine gets a little concerned, having heard that talk about, you know, following the right path, because he doesn't want it to be perceived that he's out. You know, corrals things like pushes cousin Lulu into a uh, like an alleyway or the doorway of a building where you can't she wouldn't be noticed. He kind of lurks, makes sure Ricky doesn't see him, and Ricky walks by, and then Mueller, you know, goes to retrieve cousin Lulu, who is not too happy being treated that way. And of course, his his uh, comment would more or less, "Well, I'm down here to train. I have to make sure Mr. Ricky doesn't think I'm, uh, you know." going around time with women, even if, you know, even though it was his cousin. He just didn't want to leave the wrong wrong impression on his uh, on his boss as he's trying to make the grade in, in the major leagues. And, you know, you know, whereas, you know, these guys are like, you know, A1 personalities, Connie Mack, on the other hand, was really soft-spoken. Yeah, but Connie, a uh, few moments, I mean, the, Bill Su- the, the, the Sullivan moment reference in the book where he kind of basically – be rated the guy for making two boneheaded plays in one game. But, yeah, for the most part, you know, he was kind of the soft-spoken guy that came across as the, well, the nickname, the tall tactician, you know, basically moving his players around on the field, directing things like a master, uh, you know, chess player, you know, moving his pizzas around on the board. But, yeah, he was, still, you know, definitely a little different. Yeah, definitely had dealt with one of the toughest head cases of all time, not in this era, but the dead ball era, Rue Baudel, but uh, definitely had had his uh, practice at dealing with the uh, major league player that was a bit eccentric or uh, odd at times. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because there was a lot of good World Series uh, during, the, um, during the 20s. Which one do you find the most fascinating? Uh, that's going to be probably... The two, well, 24 and 25, basically, because it went seven games. You know, Washington beating the Giants in 24 on the couple baseballs hitting pebbles or something in the field, of bouncing over Freddie Lindstrom's head, which also was the way they won the you know seventh game and the title. And then in 25, the Pirates being done three games and one, they actually rallied back to take the series. And game seven at Forbes Field was played in a pretty much a – rainstorm all day, and Walter Johnson had trouble, you know, dealing with the wet conditions, and the Pirates ended up winning that one 9-7. I mean, but the interesting thing is, you know, the Yankees getting on a roll. They start with the sweep over the Pirates in 27, the sweep over the Cardinals in 28, then 29, of course, the A's beat the Cubs. But when the Yankees, you know, this is a different decade, but they get back in 32, and it's a sweep over the Cubs again, so... Yeah, it's kind of good that they kind of set that thing in motion where they were able to pretty much just knock teams off without much resistance and fall classic action. But of course, you know, the Subway Series probably is just be, being contentious between the, Cup, or the Giants and the Yankees. From 21 to 23, that was just great theater with the stuff behind the scenes. Like in 21, Bob Musil and Earl Smith, uh, Musil not liking Smith's attitude or tipping his bat in the one game, and basically when Musil's going to steal home, he basically tells Smith he's coming, he's going to get a piece of him. And then when the time comes, Smith gets out and makes sure he gets out of the way because he don't want to have nothing to do with the guy. So, But it's kind of two of the old guard, new guard for those three, the Giants. Still trying to show that they were the main game in town, and the Yankees ready to say, well, we're ready to embark on this great new era for us, which they did in 23. That was the uh, start of 
many, many, many championships. And, you know, for McGraw in 22, that was his last World Series title. I mean, it ended up, you know, losing to, to Washington in 24. And, you know, um, Ron, time is like, uh, time is catching up. I was, can you believe it's been an, almost an hour already that we've been here? Yes. Unfortunately, unfortunately you know, I'm going to have to end our inquiry. But let that's, me ask you this. Let me ask you, did you have a good time here today? Oh, know? absolutely. Love talking baseball. I'm, man, I appreciate you inviting me. It's always great to talk about some long-ago eras that may not be forgotten for everybody, but you try to, you know, bring the light some some memories of, yeah, you know, like some of the stories. I'm sure there's some that some people in this in baseball's roaring twenties that some people have have read, but I try to also include stories that are like you had said at, at the beginning that aren't aren't well known about little known players. I want to give the little guy his due in these books too. I mean, besides the star guys, you know, I want to give those guys that are off the peripheral. You know that's why the you know the minor league chapter gets done. I do do that. I did that in characters from the diamond, and in this in this book, I even did the chapter about the the fans, so more or less. Try give you know give them their place too, because they do have a key role in in the whole performance symphony, the orchestration, and what goes on in the diamond. But yes, I definitely enjoyed. Uh, glad you invited me. I enjoyed being on the show today. It's great to have you. You know, we're gonna. We're probably gonna, what I'm gonna do is probably I'm gonna send you another instant message. I don't know what your schedule is like over the summer, but maybe in the fall we'll get you back. I want to be on the books. We'll talk about that because, you know, these are errors that, like you mentioned, not a lot of people understand or uh, know about. But I think your books are detailed enough to at least, you know, not only give just an overview, but at least get into some of the meat that actually comprise this era. And, and your books really do show how and why these uh, errors are important and how it contributed uh, to modern-day baseball as we know it. So, well, Thank you very much, Ian. I appreciate that. Hey, it's always good to have you around, man. I love you in my sights. I love your books. Hold the line for a second. I'm going to end the show, and I'll just talk to you for about 30 seconds. I know you got to run. Uh, where can we find the book besides Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everything else? Is it on uh, the book? Uh, Roman and Littlefield is the uh, publisher. Uh their website is just uh, roman.com. That'd be R O W M A N dot com. I'm going to bring it up here to be sure I got it right. But yeah, basically uh, Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble would be where to go for that. Well, that sounds good. Now hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, going. hold on. I'm just going to show. Yeah, it's it's roman.com. R O W M A N dot com for the, if you go direct through the publisher. All right, fantastic. So just hang on for a second. This is how I end it. Folks, I uh, had a great time with Ron today. You learned a lot about the Roaring Twenties, maybe characters you didn't know, maybe stuff that, you know, is second nature to you. But whatever the case is, go out, get the Roaring Twenties. You're going to have a rollicking good time with it. As always, I am Ian Kahanowitz. Thank you, Ron Waldo, for being here today. And in the words of Edward L. Morrow, good night, folks. Good luck. See you next time.